My name is John Knoll. I'm Chief Creative Officer at Industrial Light and Magic. The story goes back to when Kathy came to Lucasfilm and announced this new slate of, of Star Wars films. And while she announced a 789 that everyone could imagine this being, you know, the continuation of the Skywalker saga, um, what had a lot of us intrigued was this idea of doing standalone Star Wars stories, that, uh, adventures that take place in the Star Wars universe but aren't necessarily part of that through line. And I think the first one that had been announced was the Han Solo story that's in production right now. Um, but uh, just talking with friends at the, at the company, we were talking about what are, what are the possibilities uh, of what these films could be. And I don't know how serious I really was at the time, but I started informally pitching this, uh, and taking that uh, the first few sentences from the crawl of episode four and elaborating on it and building on it. Um, uh, 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 imagine SEAL Team 6 in the Star Wars universe on this desperate mission to penetrate into the most secure facility in the Empire to steal the Death Star plans. And you know, I, I would tell this, uh, pitch this, uh, this, this story, and I would get these very good reactions from my friends. And so uh, I kind of, just as a mental exercise, started working through sort of who the characters are and what the plot logic was and, uh, and how to make this into a more fully formed story. And I, at one point, uh, I was at... Um, uh, having dinner with a uh, friend, and and he asked about this story that he had heard I'd pitched to somebody else, and uh, so I did the most elaborate version of it, twenty minute long version of it in great detail, and uh, he said, "You you really have to pitch this to Kathy." And you know, as soon as he said that, I realized that he was right. That if I didn't, I would always wonder what would have happened if I had. Um, so I thought, I, I, well, I should do it just to see, you know, what happens. So I would, won't always wonder. So I did the pitch, and uh, I got a surprisingly good reaction, and sort of snowballed into where we are now. My additional responsibilities uh, as uh, an executive producer, as well, meant that uh, I had at least a seat at the table um, in many other issues uh, beyond the visual effects. Uh, casting, art direction, uh, even uh, sound, and and uh, almost any creative part of the show, I, I had at least uh, an opportunity to get in there and see if I could shape it a little bit more. Gareth has a visual effects background, so he's he's quite sophisticated technically. So he doesn't need a great deal of education about um, some of those trade-offs, but he hasn't worked as much on big tentpole pictures. So he's got perhaps more of an indie mindset to these things. And, and uh, so he's spring-loaded to want to do as much in camera as possible. So where I feel like that sometimes doesn't make sense, where uh, the scale of a build is kind of beyond what uh, uh, really makes good value for money sense, um, I'll try to persuade. And I can show examples, and I've been through many pre-productions with other directors where um, I've learned through hard experience um, where there are confusion points where people um, get nervous about this or that. So I've learned to collect material to help facilitate some of those discussions. Um, I, I had a, a big collection of our virtual set work for those inevitable discussions of um, how much set do we really build and where do we stop the build and leave off uh, to do virtual. And for those who are a little worried about, yeah, but will virtual sets look real or are they always going to look a bit like they were shot on a blue screen stage? I can show examples where that can reassure people that uh, no, it'll be fine. Um, so it's, it's a matter of showing examples um, and trying to be persuasive about, uh, I think this is a better way to go. For me, it's actually pretty early. Uh, something that I like to do on every picture I work on is to get together with the director of photography some months before principal photography begins, so before too much has been set in stone about how things are going to be shot. 
and I like to take them through uh, sort of the common list of things that I have seen over the years are pitfalls where big tent pole pictures will shoot things wrong in a way that is very hard to fix in post and try and work through better ways to do this and to advocate for, well, if we shot it this way, it's going to work better. And so a good example of that on Rogue was we had some scenes that were uh, daytime interior with a window out to something that, that was never going to get built. So um, you could do it as a trans light. You could do it just as a blue screen. Uh, you could do it uh, as a painted backing of some kind. But um, uh, something that I've, I've seen go wrong on a lot of pictures is if you don't have some representation of what's out there, um, some way of visualizing that, um, getting the exposure ratio, foreground to background, uh, color matching, all that kind of thing, uh, is, is hard to, to do well, and you often end up with uh, blue screen plates that are really just exposed for the foreground and not really thinking about what the finished image is going to be. So I got to talking through where that has gone wrong in other, other movies and where it's gone right, and how can we approach this in a way that's going to get us the best result. And after a bunch of discussion, Greg and I got uh, excited about um, using LED screens for much of that kind of work um, because we could put a very bright image that um, allowed you to get uh, um, sort of technically correct contrast ratio and you can see the whole thing in camera at once. And it solved some other problems for me. For all that co spacecraft cockpit work, uh, something that's always a problem is doing really good, meaningful lighting on characters that are sort of traveling through a complex lighting environment. And we knew we were going to have that in a number of places. Our uh, X-wings and U-wings were going to be flying uh, in the space battle past uh, lasers and explosions and in and out of shadow and the bounce of a sunlit spaceship on this side and then the cool fill of the planet below from that side all in a very dynamic and constantly changing way. And, you know, the traditional gags for, for doing that with uh, propeller gags and uh, uh, grips putting flags in front of lights, I, I find that all to be kind of uh, lacking and not realistic. And the idea of, of using essentially image-based lighting but in the real world where you prepare the imagery in advance of what's going to be around them and use that to light your characters. Um, seems like a really good solution to that problem because uh, you can get all kinds of subtlety. Anything can, can be represented as an image can be part of the lighting solution. And so we built this you know, giant LED screen set up to surround all our spacecraft cockpits. Uh, we worked with Third Floor to, to make um, all the imagery that was going to be around our, our characters. And while my motivation was primarily about trying to do really high-quality lighting on the, the characters, there were some other benefits that came along with it. Um, one of them that I hadn't really thought too much about was just that the um, uh, pilot's helmets are, are a bit shiny. And you could see explosions and lasers and TIE fighters flying by reflected in the helmet in a way that we never got before um, without you know, very deliberate planning. And that just sort of came for free with that approach. And another thing that, uh, that was really nice for the actors was uh, rather than us kind of talking them through eye lines, uh, you know, where a spaceship was going to be, uh, it was all represented there. They could see it. It was on a, you know, what amounted to a giant TV in front of them. So they didn't need to be told where to, to look. And it was a little more immersive, and they could really kind of get into the feel of, you know, being in the space battle. So it was just better for the actors as well. Well, way back in pre-production, um, we started playing with uh, virtual set scouting. So prior to, to building uh, foam core models in the, in the art department, um, we would start by building concept models just um, in a computer and getting those over onto our uh, sort of VR stage where you can, um, uh, we have a big projection volume where you can put on stereo glasses that have tracking marks on them, and then uh, our motion capture system kind of knows where your eyes are and generates stereo views in the projection environment 
that uh, are in that uh, in that virtual world, and it's a uh, it was a really good way to viscerally understand the scale uh, of a of a set and what the sight lines would be in a way that's really about impossible to do with uh, foam core models. You can get a lipstick camera down in there, but uh, really, um, you know, being in that room virtually and seeing how high the ceiling is and how far that wall is and uh, that kind of thing was really very helpful and you could iterate quickly and we have some tools for editing the scene for kind of moving things around and you know if you want to see what it looks like if that wall is a little further away you can just slide it over and that was kind of neat that we did that uh, for the first time on on that show and then um, we wanted to have a portable version of it so we built one that worked with an oculus so that um, all you needed was a workstation hooked up to an Oculus and you could you know, navigate around inside a virtual space. Uh, then one other area that, um, that we used virtual cameras on um, was uh, all the, the synthetic uh, parts of the, the movie, spacecraft in transit or space battle, uh, something that didn't start from a photograph plate. And the, what got me thinking about using virtual cameras on that was just watching the way Gareth worked on set. Um, he has a bit of an unconventional and more documentary coverage style. So when he shows up on set, he doesn't have a book of storyboards that he's drawn for this, and he, he isn't going to walk onto set and say, all right, uh, camera A is going to be here with a 50, and camera B is going to be here with a 75, and these are our setups. It's, it's a little more free form than that. He'll show up with the actors, and he'll give them only very loose direction um, or uh, blocking and uh, allow them to kind of find blocking that feels more natural to them. And then as he's his own camera operator, we'll start fishing around in the scene just to figure out how he wants to cover this, you know, exactly what framing looks good. And Gareth has a genius for that, of, of being able to look through the viewfinder and find this really nice composition. And so that has a, a very uh, unplanned and spontaneous and kind of documentary feel to it that I, I thought was very exciting. But as soon as I saw him doing that, uh, I thought, well, how are we going to get that same feel into space battle and shots of ships in transit where we're not going to start with something that's, that's photographed? And I thought animating these scenes in advance, getting them set up to run in real time on the, in our motion capture volume and giving Gareth a virtual camera so he can do the same thing. Go into that scene and find those angles that look interesting and do a session where he just tries things. You can walk out of that session with what amount to a bunch of dailies and then go into editorial and cut it like he cuts anything else. Um, and he loved that and I thought that was really successful. And I've got some, um, in the talk I'll do tomorrow, I have some examples um, that are just long screen captures of Gareth kind of fishing around with the virtual camera. And what's, what's fascinating is watching the, the screen capture, you can kind of sense his thought process. He'll try something and you'll kind of see what was unsatisfying about that one. You'll see, you'll see him kind of mentally going through a process of, yeah, you know what, it should be bigger at the beginning and then it should be, and, and uh, actually, no, that's kind of cool. What if I, what if I frame in on that? And over the course of some of these long capture sessions, you can see him design these really interesting shots. And I thought that was a really very successful use of the virtual cameras. There was a fair amount of previs that was done uh, for all the sort of big logistically complicated sequences. Um, and it was a, a mixture of uh, trying to figure out um, how long a sequence was going to be run, whether we you know, had room for this and this action or whether we needed to simplify. So there's some of that. Um, there was also a, a need, like you have on a lot of big complicated movies, to have something to be able to go over with all the departments to start breaking down how we're actually going to shoot it. Where are we going to build? How are we going to do that? How are we going to do that? Um, and you know, really planning what the, the next months are going to be like. So there, there was a fair amount of that. Um, um, more dialogue scenes or scenes that were not that complicated didn't get pre um because we figured we could just um, 
you know, work on the fly as we as we do.